It is about a rule that the Swedish chess president, uh, when he was elected, said is the most important thing for every chess federation and chess player, chess trainer, and is the outside and in perspective. What does that mean? That means that you should always put yourself in the other part's position. For example, if I want a school to have chess, I cannot go to the school and say, I want you to have chess. Instead, you need the, to understand what can make a school interested in chess. Of course, if I go to a school and say, I think you should go for chess, they say, why? But if I go to a school and I say, I can offer you a tool that can train your ch children's brain. They can train concentration ability. They can give your children higher grades. This is what I can offer for you. And this is fun for the children. And it's easy for the teachers to use. They would say, this is fantastic. Of course we want that. If you want a sponsor, to help you with chess. You must understand what do the sponsor want from chess? What, what could be interesting for them? Do you think it's a lead player of chess? I don't think so. But for example, we just had the first big sponsor in Swedish chess before we have tried to sell elite chess in Sweden. But now instead we say, we want to help the children in the Swedish schools. And suddenly they get interested because we don't sell chess. Chess is only the tool to achieve something. And in this case, when we come to chess in schools, I think it's very important to put yourself in the child's position. Why should they do chess? What is interesting? And then, of course, again, we have these questions about should it be a teacher, the, uh, the normal teacher? Should it be a tutor? or should be a teacher plus a tutor that are in charge of, of chess in schools. And I want to tell you a little bit about this lady here. This is Anne. It's actually the first chess teacher I had in Sweden. And she was, of course, my own children's teacher, you know, after school teacher. She was 62, 62 years old when I, we started. And she said she didn't know how to play chess at all when we started. And she said, you can, I can never learn because there are so many pieces jumping around. It's impossible for me to do this, you know. But she's a fantastic teacher, so I, know, I knew she could do it. And then I said, okay, but take it step by step and so on. And she said, okay, I will try. And we do all these kind of exercises that you did now. We took it step by step, arranging tournaments and so on. And she became a fantastic chess teacher. But what was very interesting with her was also that she had no respect for the game. And I say that it in a positive sense. Because she said to me, OK, you have your game and so on, but I'm not so interested in chess, but I'm interested in the children. I want to create something that is good for the children. And I believe chess can be good, but I want to do it my way. Next time I came to her lessons and I saw all the children sitting and playing because it became very popular with chess when she was doing it. She had 50 kids at the same time when she was doing this. And she said to me, you know, I've started to invent new chess games. And I said, okay, <laughs> this would be very interesting to see what have you done. And she said, I have invented a game called Stormy Weathers. Okay, what is Stormy Weathers, I said. Every child was playing everywhere, but in the mid middle of the game, they, she said, Stormy Weathers, all the children must run up and find a new position. That's the deal. What is happening is that it's a big fight of all the good positions. You know, if you have to change, you have to run around and find where is the best position. Ah, here is a queen up and everyone is fighting for this one and they fight for the next one. It was totally chaos in the room, children running everywhere. And I thought, can you really do this to chess? No. <laughs> I said, this is crazy. But then I looked at the children and the children loved it. And then I realized now I am a chess player. I take chess and I give it to the teachers. 
and the teachers will use chess in the best way for them, in the best way for the children. <coughs> And now it's so interesting because a lot of the chess teachers in Sweden have started to invent new games using chess in a new way. She also invented a new a game called long chess. She said to me, I think it's terrible that the children is playing one by one like this. They should play together. So she put three chess sets beside each other, three children at each side and it's a long chess board like this. And what you can do is, the rule is like this, you play three and three in a team, and it's enough if you mate one of the kings. And you understand that the rooks and queens and bishops can go over the three boards. So the children sit like this. Let's go for this king in, the, in, that, in that chess set. And they bring all the rooks and queens and bishops to one chess set on this side, and they go for that king. And they uh, work together, and it's heavy attacks and they win. Again, my first thought was, can you really do this to a chess game? You know, I was a bit worried, but the children loved it. And again, she developed chess into something usable for her. And I think this is very important to think about. Another thing is that she was thinking for the child's perspective. What you need to do is to think about, of course, the age of a child. The biggest mistake, I think, that the that chess instructors is doing is not to think about what kind of words should I use. I think it's very important that you use the words that the child can understand from their age. And not the least these kind of metaphors like building a fence, building a, making a guard, and these kind of words that could be understandable for a child is very usable if you work with children, not the least if they are young ones. Now we come to a very important part. It is this about development. What you have seen when you teach in whatever subject is that what you want to do is to find the stretch zone of a child. This, I would call it the comfort zone. It is the knowledge you have. You have this knowledge, how to play, what to do. But if you want to become better in something, you must find a stretch zone, when you are on the verge of what you know and what you can do. What does this mean? This means that you need to try and go for difficulties. This that is on the verge of what you can do, and it, this means that you will fail 50% of the times, because you are on the verge of what you can do. What is important if you want the children to become in the stretch zone? Then it's very important that they can fail without that you become angry or disappointed or anything else. And that is why I'm so, you know, I get so uh, angry when I see chess instructors. You know, you see children, maybe even here you see chess children, they lose a game and then the chess instructor comes, how can you play this? This is such a bad move. What will happen the next time the child plays is that they will only play moves that is inside the comfort zone. Safe moves. Okay, my, my trainer has said I should put the rooks like this, I should play like this. They will only play this kind of moves inside the comfort zone. But if you want the child to stretch out to become better, you need to, be, need to encourage them to try out to find new ideas, to expand their possibilities. You want them to be in your stretch zone. This is difficult when you do group training, we all know, but now not the least with technology, you, the, each child can fi, uh, follow their individual route. And this is possible with technology. And then they can always be in the stretch zone on the verge of what they can do. What I have tried to do for the last 10 years is to find a good practical model for how to teach chess. And what I use is the SMART method. And this, I think, is very good for chess instruction. Also for chess training, but not the least for chess in schools. And the SMART method is about self-learning, motivation, adjustment of knowledge, uh, adjustment of level, 
range of activities and technology. What do I mean with this? First of all, if you have seen a lot of chess instructors, and I have seen many of them, they love to stand in front of the chess board and show you should think like this, you should do like that, you should do like that. Next time you play, play like this, 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 this. But it is shown that if you want to learn, you must test for yourself. It's, you, it's the child who must try. It's the child who should learn, not the trainer who sh that should show how good he or she is. And that means that it's the child that should try. It's also at least half of the lesson, I always let the children play games. Even when I train national teams, it should be like problem solving, playing. They should be active, not me. And what teachers should do is also to help the children to find the answers. They should not do the answering for them, but help them with the process of how to find the answers. Then the child is active, then they will develop. Motivation. We spoke about that a bit earlier on. How do we motivate the children to continue to play chess and train chess? First of all, there has been a lot of uh, uh, studies on what is important when the child wants to, uh, you know, the, the children. For example, my, my boy, he is uh, now he's 13 years old. He loves football the most in life. That's what he loves. Today, he only played basketball. Mm. How is this possible? I love football and I hate basketball. How, how can he play this game, uh, basketball? The reason for this is that he started to play football when he was seven years old with his best friend that is eight years old. He came to the football club and the football club said, I'm sorry, you are eight and you are seven, you play in different teams. What happened? They stopped playing. For a child, the most important thing is a good environment. And who can create a good environment? It is the leader, it's the chess teacher, the chess instructor. How do you create a good environment? The first thing is to see the child. What I do is that I always try to learn the names of um, every child that I have. And I have a rule for myself. I try to say each child's name every lesson, at least one time. Because then they feel that I as a leader have seen them. It creates a good atmosphere. It was very interesting now because I had um, uh, Maya Chiburdanitsi, you know, the world, former world champion. She was at this course when I had this course in Batumi because she's going now for chess in schools in Georgia. She finds this, that's, this is very important. And she said, well, the first thing I will do before every child comes, I will want to have the photograph of each child to learn their names. So when they come to the door, I want to say hello and their name because then they feel seen by me. And she knows the importance of this, that you've been seen. It doesn't matter what your result, if you win, if you lose, you want to feel this good environment that everyone is seeing. So try to meet every child. Another way of meeting his child is, for example, when I discuss with a child, nearly always I go down to my knees to have the same eye contact like this. Because if you are adult and you look down at the child, it's not as respectful as if I'm on my knees, then I talk like this, and they see, I respect you, I listen to you, you are important. So, another rule I have is to make everyone succeed every lesson. You know also when you have groups of children, someone is always winning, someone is always losing. Those who are winning all the time, they normally continue with chess. That's the normal rule. So the difficulty is how to make the children that is always losing to make them continue with chess. I try always, because I know what children that is normally losing all games and so on, I try to find out good ways to give them encouragement to continue. I can say, you know, I know that this child over there, she's always losing, so I see her, she makes a good move. I say, oh, that was a good move, good play, that's great. So she feel encouraged, even though she might lose. Or I can give her some extra points for helping me or do other stuff. I try to find out this. And then, of course, in the end, never forget this. Children want to develop. 
you need to stretch them to give them new knowledge, then they want to continue with chess. So, now it comes to adjustment of level. This is something that is very difficult in a group. You know, someone is very good, someone is very weak, some is interested in chess, some is not so interested. It's not easy to make a proper challenge for everyone. If you want them to be in the stretch zone. But for example, what do I do? I always have an extra chess board in my classroom with extra exercises for those who are very uh, good in chess that are more interested. So if they finish the exercise, I can say I have a special task for you over there so they can go and have some, some challenges for them. Then, of course, what you can do is to divide the group into children with the same ability so that they can have a proper challenge. If you use these kind of mini games that I showed you, you can divide the group. Here we play across the board, here we play with all the pieces, here we play like that. Everyone gets a proper challenge. Then, of course, you can also have an extension of exercises. You can make them step by step so everyone can have this proper challenge. Now, range of activities. I think, when I'm not the least when I see chess trainers, this is what normally fails. It's, it's so easy that you have the same way how to teach uh, chess. Every lesson is the same. But to keep up motivation and the interest of the game, you must find uh, activities that are different. It must be, uh, someone said, uh, the most famous uh, football trainer in, in Sweden that we had, uh, he said that in every uh, training there should be something new. And this is a rule I have. Every chess training I give, every for if it's uh, beginners or if it's very good players, I try to find some exercise or something that is new to them because then they are on their toes. They don't really know what's happening. And this could be, you know, it could be in presentation, it could be how you organize the group, it could be the theme, something new I try to find so it becomes interesting. So it's a range of activities. And then we come to technology. There is so good stuff out there. Right now, I, I must say, I, I am very much into Chessity. That is a chess program that I just find is, it's, it's fantastic uh, for chess in schools. But there are others as well. There is learning chess. There is the chess palace. It's, um, uh, so there are uh, many, many good things right now. That is, and a lot of hap it's, it's happening. But I think that technology can make everyone get the, uh, them into the stretch zone that we spoke about to make them develop in their pace. Personally, I don't use so much ch technology when I do my lessons. But what I want, and this you know as chess trainers, instructors and so on, the key if a child develops is when they start to train on their own at home. You know, you don't have to tell them to do something, they just do it by themselves. And to play on the net, to get exercises on the net, today it's fantastic possibilities. So what I always do with my class is that I give them the possibility to train and play on the net, and I hope they do it between the lessons. And then they will develop rapidly. So, any questions on the SMART method? Is, was everything clear, or is that something you want me to, to, to clarify? That's okay? Okay, now we come to another thing that I think is so crucial for good uh, teaching. We said in the beginning that it's, uh, of, of this uh, part that it's important that it's the child who, who should learn. And that means that the child should be um, active themselves. And one big mistake that a lot of uh, trainers and instructors do is that uh, the child doesn't solve uh, a position, for example, then you show the right solution. What I try to do is always to help the child to find the solution themselves. Because if they do, the learning process is so much better. The most easy way to do that 
is, for example, uh, let's say that it's a chess tournament and the child raises the hand and say it's checkmate and you go there. What I always do, I, I never say yes it's checkmate or no it's not checkmate. But I say to the child, okay let's work together and see if it's checkmate. We start with the three mating questions, you know. First of all, can you take the piece that is threatening the king? Can the king run away? Can you put something in between? And we work together and I ask them, which piece is threatening the king? Can you take this one? I guide them towards an answer and they find out for themselves. In this process, they learn so much more than if I tell them the answer. I call this the method of questioning. So that means that the teacher is more like a guide to the child towards the answer than the, the solution. What I usually use is three types of questions. It's open questions, structured questions, and specific questions. Open questions. And this is actually, even though you do not know chess, you can know these questions. So you can help the child to develop, even though you don't know so much. Why did you play that move? It's an open question to a child. They can explain. What is your plan in this position? What do you want to do? and this kind of stuff, and they start to think about this, you know. Then you have more structured questions. For example, what I, you know, I always want my children to reflect on the game they have just played, to develop themselves. For example, what, what I always say to my children, tell me three things you have learned in, uh, in, in this game. Okay, I should not go out with my queen so it can be taken. I should watch out for the attack. It could be, you know, it could be this kind of stuff. Uh, and they try to find things that they have learned. Another very good question is this. If you could play three moves in a row, which moves would that be? Because they start to think, I want to go here, I want to go here, I want to go there, or checkmate. Oh, that's a good, good plan, you know? To try to find this sequence, the ideal dream position we spoke about, an ideal sequence to that. That's a very good way to give them the thinking process of visualization. And then we, we have a very specific question. It could be, where is the weak spot of your opponent? Which of your opponent's pieces are not protected? These kind of, of questions also help them to find an answer. Again, instead of you saying, can you see that this piece is unprotected? It's much better to say, what piece of the opponent is not protected? And they guide them towards the answers by these questions. So it could be open, structured and specific questions like how are you doing in your game? How do you test for checkmate? What, which is your worst place piece? Yeah, these type of questions. I have a battery of questions that can be used in different situations to help the child to find the answer. 